Let's start with Ephesians 5, 21 to 25. Submitting to one another in the fear of God, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, as just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Ephesians, uh, let's see, Five, verse 28, 28 and 33. 33. So all men to love their wives as their own bodies, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. And 33. 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Amen. Ephesians 6, 1-3 Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. 5-7 through seven. Slaves, obey your earth and master with respect and fear, and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men. Okay, we can see the authority that Paul has outlined there. <clears throat> it's somewhat <laughs> uncomfortable words for modern day pop pop. <coughs> And I just want to say that if it is to work under God, the husbands have to be willing to love their wives even as Christ also loved the church. That's the condition upon which they can claim the headship in the family. The husband is to represent Jesus and be like him to his wife and to his children. So he's not to be an overlord or a dictator. And when that is taking place, wives genuinely, I believe, like that. Mm -hmm. And if it's not in place, then they genuinely think that they have to step it up. And then you have a lot of wives who provide this spiritual leadership for, the, for their family. Um, my mother provides the spiritual leadership for my family. I didn't live up with, live, grow up with a father that, uh, who mentored me in the Lord. It was my mother that did it, I'm glad she did. But we are called as men to be that kind of person. When I was young in ministry, maybe I'll tell them this down because the next picture is easier to see. But when I was young in ministry, I would work late just out of necessity to have Bible studies to be at present board meetings, and Patsy, early on, she tried to stay up for me, but she was still getting up very early, and she had to make a choice, and so she decided to go to bed early, which was really the spiritual choice for her to make, so she could get up early enough to have devotions, and she would be ready for the children, and it's a good thing you did that. Yeah. Uh, Pastors keep later hours. I didn't keep real late hours, but I'd get home after a while and she would already be in bed. I understood why, and no problem with that, because I knew she'd get up early and have devotions, and I knew the children were getting up very early. And I'd get up early, but not, not quite as early as that. So it works out. I'll let you take the. So next our part. goal <laughs> in our home was to uh, love Jesus first, the two of us. That was our priority. And then our other thing was to raise our children to love the Lord and to um, love the Adventist lifestyle, uh, to love the standards that our church sets up, um, and to uh, love God's Word. And so I'm just going to share with you just a foundation um, this, uh, that we had in our home standards. Um, we, we didn't have a TV in our home. We did in the beginning because someone gave it to us, but we found it controlled our lives, so we got rid of it. Um, Dan was ruin, uh, making his ministry kind of around it so he could see the news at 6.30. Um, so we decided not to get rid of it. And uh, we had a piano, so and we 
we played a lot of hymns in our home. Uh, that was the music. Um, if toys come into our home, and I'm just sharing with some of the standards, the toys do not have jewelry on them, you know, either Barbie dolls. And so we made sure that the Barbie dolls, uh, we, don't, we didn't want anything um, influencing them in, to, in a negative way uh, and take them down the wrong path. Um, we also um, did not have a deck of cards in our home. Um, we, uh, I'm talking about barroom cards. Uh, we did have things like a Uno or, you know, uh, cards like that, but we really tried to make everything as spiritually um, a go uh, to just keep them on track. Um, we loved, we, every time there was a church function, it's not because we were a pastor's family, we would have done this with or without that, um, but we loved going to prayer meeting. We took our kids to prayer meeting. We took them in gathering. Do you guys still in gather down here? Christmas caroling in gathering. Um, we took them to that. We took them to every evangelistic meeting. Um, we did everything. And where there was places where they themselves could be involved actually doing something, we volunteered them to do special music, uh, read scripture, whatever it took. They were very much involved up front, and then, you know, so they got comfortable with that. Um, and by the way, we had lots of hugs and kisses, and we're very close to one another. It wasn't just um, what I call <coughs> swirling around. But um, as they got older, we took them on mission trips. We went to Romania, Central America. Every time the church had one, uh, we would do our best to uh, ministry with family. Family was ministry. We homeschooled them until the age of 10. Uh, we read that in Ellen White's writings that it's best to keep the children home until the age of 10. I know some our, our grandkids have, have went longer. But um, we, we truly got called into the conference office because we were homeschooling our kids. They wanted them in church school. So we, you know what I mean? We blazed a trail at that point. It was kind of a new thing. Now it's, it's accepted. But um, we, and I, you know, it's just the way it was. Um, we, we just did all kind of things that uh, brought them closer to Jesus Christ. We prayed, prayed, prayed. We listened, we listened, and we listened, and we kept the communication lines open. It's the same thing in a church family. You do the same thing. You communicate, you work together as a team, uh, you pray for each other, and uh, you listen a lot. And then there's this togetherness. The kids learn piano. We wanted to, we didn't want rock music to come into our home, so we took an aggressive uh, form of action. They both play the piano, one plays the violin, one plays the flute, they both play the guitar, uh, and it's being carried on into the next generation of grandchildren. So it is, the DNA can be changed. We both come from uh, divided homes, we did not want our home to be divided. So we had to work extra hard with just the two of us when you come from a broken home and then to present, to break that generational curse. Isn't that what it's called? So that it can go forward and uh, be, be a, a witness to the Lord. And our kids today uh, reflect by God's grace uh, that kind of, of lifestyle. So thank you, Patsy. Um, we. We have three secrets you know, about this one big secret that really changed our children from from early on so we wouldn't have to fight so hard, so to speak. <coughs> one is that we need to personalize our own and prioritize our own devotional life every day. I guess it was the last class you mentioned about Sabbath school. Um, maybe you've mentioned it already. But this keeps you on a daily basis, if you follow that. The Sabbath school lesson. The Sabbath school lesson. It keeps you regular in your own study. Mm -hmm. Whatever it takes, just be consistent in your own study. And you will not only be blessed Sabbath morning, like you were today, but you need it day by day. And uh, we all need it. And the pastor needs it too, not just to prepare for his sermons, which I do a lot of, a lot of, but I need something other than that just to keep me going too. So um, let's see where the second, it, yeah. the second step 
is having morning and evening worship. And it gets busy when you have kids. If you have to do it at the table, maybe you're maybe you're going to work. Maybe just the two of you, no kids, but you're everybody's going different directions. You get up early enough so you can spend that that time as um, as a couple, especially as a family raising children. Um, make sure that there's morning worship and evening worship. Our children, my Bible first. It comes from this from this locale. We love it. Um, we just got finished uh, being with our grandkids for two weeks, and uh, we learned six new songs, uh, verse every single verse. You know, we knew them already, but now we know every single verse because this comes from the Nelsons. Um, my Bible first. They have visualized songs. This is our grandson, Elijah. We did the same thing with our kids, Micah. We did the same thing with our kids, and now we're seeing it repeated in our grandkids. Our, our, grand, our kids think this is great. We're going to raise our kids the same way. And uh, so we sing. We read a lesson. We do a memory verse. We have prayer. And in and, and our own personal, we always have a spirit of prophecy book that we are reading along with the Sabbath school lesson. So that, is, <laughs> that keeps the joy going into the next generation. And there's a beautiful, simple secret. Don't bypass this as saying, oh, that's so simple. How could that do anything? But it has worked for two generations now. We've seen it with our own eyes. And other people picked it up from Patsy and they, they give us the same report. It is. What happened, my story is at 5.30 in the morning, I would strive to get up and have my own personal devotions. 20 minutes later, the kids are out of their bedrooms, ready for the day. I said, Lord, I want an hour. I don't want 20 minutes, I want an hour. And he never, he never corrected that, so I thought, well, I'm gonna have to do something. So I have a Bible. I think that you have over there. And what I did is I bought the kids a large print Bible, and I had them. Did you realize that in the book of Genesis, there the word God is all over the book, all over that book. I mean God, God, God. God created, God blessed, God sanctified. And um, so I gave them the Bible, and this is when they were four and five years old, when they could just make a circle and they circled the word God in the book of Genesis and I thought wow they're done I better find something else so I went to Matthew Mark Luke and John and uh, that's my grandson circling in, in my Bible it's cool to just look back on it but in the in Matthew Mark Luke and John Jesus oh Jesus healed Jesus blessed Jesus oh it's all there and then you go to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the word love is just flashed all over those three books. So there they are, circling the word Jesus, circling the word God, and circling the word love. Do you think they thought God was pretty good? Oh, yeah. And the book, the Bible, had those things in it. So that was their first introduction to personal devotions, their first introduction to really learning about Jesus. And they would circle for about five to seven minutes, and I would teach them how to pray, to ask Jesus into their heart, and then they go on with their day, and I could finish my hour's worth of devotions. <clears throat> it was a beautiful experience, and, it's, and when, when we go to visit our grandkids, and I, I sh cut myself short in my devotions so I could play with the grandkids, my children, my 44-year-old children will say to me, Mom, did you have your personal devotions yet? Um, okay, I'll get right to that, you know. So they, they, they keep me accountable. <clears throat> but it is, it's well worth it to see it being carried on. Our 14-year-old grandson comes up to our bedroom with his Bible and his lesson quarterly and a spirit of prophecy book. I have a table. Man, I am ready for it. I've got my devotions, and him and his sister sit there and do their devotions right next to me. And we talk about what they have read and studied. You know what? That's what heaven is. That's what heaven is. To see the commitment to Jesus Christ 
And I, it's just beautiful. Yeah, Elijah and Mariah are oldest, 14 and 12. Uh, Elijah's preached already, so uh, I think he may be thinking about ministry, but they've given their heart to Jesus. That's the most important part, and uh, it's very beautiful to see. We do a lot of family things together. Uh, here's ASI from a couple months ago. Our oldest daughter Heidi is at the piano. Uh, her husband Christian was the junior leader at ASI this year. Of course, you can see him at, on uh, Wake Up With Hope, 7 o'clock on Hope Channel, Monday through Friday. Have you heard of Hope Channel? Wake mm -hmm. Up With Hope? Mm -hmm. You have to watch, it's beautiful. You yeah. can get on the internet and watch it anytime. And we're <laughs> just about done. I want to leave time for questions. But encourage your children to think big about their careers. This is our tree house in the back of our property, and we have a little Hummer vehicle uh, that Kane is in, and Mike is up there. You know, they just love. Uh, you know, they, they they have an imagination that won't quit. But basically, the secret is uh, make a personal your devotions. Secondly, have morning and evening worship, and the third secret: while they're young, give them their own Bible. Um, have them, if they can't even read, have them circle the word, the name God and Jesus and love. And they, they identify with the Bible that way. It's the first book they ever read, even before they can read. <coughs> Their walk with God is, is beautiful from the very start that way. And uh, Dream Big Yourself, too. Patsy mentors about 100 people that want to lose weight uh, and get more healthy. Maybe that's what I should say, and it's really rewarding. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're both working on books. <coughs> Excuse me. One thing I can say, as a teenager, we ran into a lot more challenges, um, you know, when the kids want to be independent. Um, and one such time happened when Heidi decided <laughs> that she wanted to have a boyfriend and we had been teaching the children all along to be in groups to when you have socialization you don't couple off and she kind of rebelled against that or she started to and we said you're at the age where you could get a driver's license but if you cannot be mature in your relationships there will be no driver's license Heidi loved to drive. This yep. was a powwow time. This was a powwow time. And she immediately went back to just group uh, friendships. So there is, there is ways to work through these difficult situations and come out. Because now they thank us for it. Thank you. That guy was trying to touch my leg in the wrong place. You know? And so just know that and maybe you've challenged, uh, been challenged to do this if you have children of your own um, to, to be real strict and straight at the times when you have to be. You're not a friend, you're a parent. And when you're a parent, you still have to discipline. And our kids come back and they say to us, what do I do in this situation? What shall I do in this situation? They're asking us for pointers on how to raise their children. So, praise God, that's the way it's supposed to be, as we work as a team to raise our children and grandchildren. Yeah, I think they've given their heart to Jesus from the time they're three and having worship like that. It just, it does make a difference. Mm -hmm.